am I too needy or is my partner simply unable to meet my fundamental needs, which shows incompatibility in our relationship? This is a question that a lot of my anxious, preoccupied and fearful avoidant clients want to know. I know this is also a question that I had when I was recovering from my fearful avoidant attachment style and I searched the internet far and wide and I didn't really get a lot of concrete answers that I could go by. So in this video, I am going to aim to give you something that is very tangible so you can understand when you are being too needy because some of us are really too needy. And some of us are simply in relationships that cannot fulfill our needs. And we have to figure out which is which, and it can be very confusing. So I'm going to really break this down for you, make it a very digestible, and also cover what caused this confusion in the first place, how this affects our dating and choice in relationships, but also work relationships and friendships. And number three, I'm also going to help you figure out whether you are too needy or if your partner simply cannot fulfill your needs and then where to go from there. All right, so why is this a problem? Where does this question even come from? Because if you look at securely attached individuals, they don't have this problem. They know that they are allowed to have needs and that they can also ask people to fulfill their needs and they can find a balance in that. So when their partner is unavailable to fulfill their needs, they have a big social network, they have their own hobbies, activities, and they don't have that big abandonment wound or I'm unworthy, I'm not enough core wounds that make them immediately take something very personal when their partner is unavailable. So why do the anxious, preoccupied and fearful avoidant attachment style have this big question and confusion around needs? For the anxious preoccupied attachment style, what happened in childhood is that they got inconsistent need fulfillment. Inconsistent need fulfillment leads to the child creating a core wound that they are somehow deficient, insufficient, or that they are too much. So the core wounds could be, I am not enough, I am unworthy, I am unlovable, and I am too much. And often anxious, preoccupied individuals swing between this core wound of I am not enough to be loved and at the same time, I'm too much. My needs are too much. And the fearful avoidant can experience something very similar, especially if they're leaning anxious and they would be leaning anxious if they are dating a partner that is more um, dismissive avoidant. So for them, the fearful avoidance got raised with chaos. Chaos can also be inconsistency. It can be neglect. It can be chopping and changing between the two. And also the fearful avoidance might have experienced gaslighting. Programming that taught them that you are too sensitive. Why are you being such a baby? Why do you always make a problem out of everything? Those used to be the um, programs that were said to them over and over. And that is, of course, gaslighting. Sometimes gaslighting is really unintentional. It is just something that is learned from generation to generation to generation and is passed down in the family. So if you look back um, at your family life and see that, whoa, my parents actually used to gaslight me. You don't necessarily have to label them as narcissists. They could simply have just learned this type of hard upbringing from their parents and their parents and so on. So this is really ancestral stuff and generational trauma that is often passed down. This is why I often say that attachment healing is ancestral healing. But let's go back to this topic. So as you can see, from the upbringing that we received, we get information about what it means to have needs and how welcome are we to have those needs filled by others or ask for those needs to be filled by others. So let's take the secure attachment as this blueprint of something that we can work towards. 
because that's what attachment actually is. We learn attachment from the people around us. We simply mimic what they do and then we have our own attachment style. Secure attachment style, often Diane Paul Heller calls this as an attachment style and then the other attachments, the insecure attachments, she calls as adaptations because the secure attached children that were born or the infants had to adapt themselves and mold themselves in order to survive their environment. So I just like that little tidbit on the adaptation of the attachment style so that we can understand that we can adapt it back. It's just like training a muscle, it's training our nervous system. So we can look at secure people, figure out how they became the way they are, or if you have secure people in your life and you can start mimicking them and then become secure yourself. All right. I know it's not as simple, <laughs> it's difficult, but it gives us some kind of template that we did not receive when we were growing up. So let's look at securely attached individuals. When they were growing up, they got consistency, which means that when the infant cried, the parent or parents would come to the infant, pick it up and try to attune to it. See, what does it need? Does it need a diaper change? Is the baby hungry? Or does it need emotional soothing? And if this happened consistently over time, not only in infancy, but childhood, and then later on in the development, then the child develops the sense that I am worthy. Because when I am at my most vulnerable, because let's face it, babies are extremely vulnerable and they're also a lot. A lot for anybody to handle. When people say it takes a village, it really does take a village. Babies have a lot of needs. So when the child's needs are fulfilled consistently, the baby feels, oh, I'm amazing. People love me. I am great. So they have this self-concept that I am lovable and I am enough and I am worthy of love. I am worthy of being taken care of and I matter, I am important. Of course, this is very subconscious. It's just a feeling that they get. This is why secure attached individuals have a very good self-esteem because their needs were fulfilled. So through that, they develop that good self-esteem and self-confidence. So when the baby was picked up in its most vulnerable state and the parent learned to attune to the child, fulfill their needs, the child also learned that it is okay to be vulnerable and need things from other people. Therefore, securely attached individuals will go around in their life and when there is something that they need from another person, they will not feel shy to ask for it. They can simply come to you and say like, hey, I need help with my work project or with cleaning my house or with this thing I'm dealing with. Or they will just tell you, you know what, I'm feeling a little bit lonely and I feel like I just need to get out. What is happening for you? Are you available? So this is how they learn that they can just approach people that they know and they can get their needs fulfilled. And you will see that they are quite light about it. So that means that if you say to them, sorry, I can't fulfill your need, I can't go with you, I can't help you clean your house or uh, I can't help you in this uh, situation that you're going through because I've got my own stuff going on. They will usually just say, oh, okay, cool, and have some other way to fulfill their needs. So they are very capable in fulfilling their own needs because when they were growing up, they saw through what their parents did, how their parents treated them, and they've learned how to fulfill those needs for themselves. All right, so they have many strategies to fulfill their needs. So if their partner or somebody else in their environment isn't available, they have other strategies, or they can simply wait. If something really, really intense happens, a big trauma or a death, or maybe they get fired from work, they can also say, you know what, this is quite urgent and I really need you. Are you available? 
right? But if you again say no, then they will take care of themselves. So this is a very big telltale sign that they are not needy. They simply have needs. We all have needs. On this planet, every single living being has a need. Plants need air, they need water, our bodies need food, our souls need spiritual nourishment and our emotional body needs emotional nourishment and connection. You can even argue that needs is what makes the world go round, economy go round. I need something, I'm going to then connect with somebody else to get that need met and therefore we are in connection with each other. If none of us had any needs, we wouldn't have any reason to connect, right? Just observe that in your life. Every single interaction, whether you know about it or not, is some kind of need fulfillment. You picking up your device, whether it's your phone or switching this onto your PC and watching this video is also about need fulfillment. You want to find out some kind of information and I have the need to contribute into people's lives and therefore we are exchanging these needs. So there's nothing wrong with having needs. Needs are beautiful. They are given to us by, let's say, a higher power. If you study Marshall Rosenberg's work about needs, this is really, really beautiful. Nonviolent communication. If you feel like you're really needy, Go and study that work deeply and it will really help you to make peace with your needs. Now, where we start to get needy on the other hand is when we have what I call the hole in the soul. And I know I had that. The hole in the soul is a phrase that comes from a 12-step program or 12-step programs in general. And it is this phenomena where we feel like we are just this bottomless pit of needs. And nothing we do seems to soothe that pain that we are experiencing inside. No matter how much we're trying to soothe ourselves, there is something that is really deep, 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 deep that needs nourishing. And when we don't know how to fulfill that need... That is often when we have an anxious, preoccupied, fearful, avoidant, or even a dismissive, avoidant attachment style, but especially the fearful avoidant, right? Because there was so much chaos and so much pain in the upbringing. This can lead to addictive patterns, any type of addiction. So we have substance addictions, drugs, alcohol, food. We have process addictions such as gambling, scrolling through the internet aimlessly, pornography. And then we can also be addicted to relationships and people and situations. Okay, I think I don't even have to explain that to you because most of us know if we have this anxious, preoccupied or fearful avoidant attachment style, the connections we can create feel like an addiction. There are these highs and then these lows and then we are good when we are with the person and everything is going fine and then everything is terrible and it creates a neurochemical cocktail in our brain and there it actually creates an addiction which Susan Anderson calls abandonalism but that is for another video. However, this is what I want to point to. When our needs haven't been fulfilled consistently in childhood and we don't know how to fulfill those needs, we have this big hole in the soul. And that hole in the soul is a combination of our core wounds that, are keep, that keep us keep on shouting that I'm not good enough, I am unworthy, I'm unlovable. And there is this need to fulfill that, to soothe that pain. And we want something from the external world to come in and take that pain away. And we think that if only our partner can be there, if only our partner can text us back, if only our partner can tell us that they love us or be more affectionate towards us, we believe that this hole in the soul is somehow going to dissolve. But most of the time, if we have the anxious, preoccupied and fearful avoidant attachment styles, 
this thing does not just go away when we are in relationship. It's almost like this hungry beast that just needs to be fed, 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 fed. And the reason why it's like that is because of that dysfunction, the core wounds, and because the real, the real pointer or the real magnetism that uh, this core wound or this, this hole in the soul is trying to pull us in towards is to connect with ourselves, okay? To connect with our own emotional body, to connect back with ourselves. Because through insecure attachment, we got disconnected from ourselves. And no matter how much we try to connect with other people, it is not going to fill that hole. That is the shape of the connection that you have with yourself, with your emotional body, with your inner child, with your spirit, or whatever it is that you believe you have, something deeper than just this physical body. That is the calling to come home to yourself. And when we start to notice that and stop using other substances, processes, or people to temporarily numb that pain. That thing that feels so unquenchable and bottomless begins to get soothed. When we start to validate our own feelings, our own experience, and instead of numb out, abandon, or betray ourselves, we start to become present in our bodies and fulfill those needs consistently. Those needs that were not fulfilled throughout our lives. And it's the most beautiful thing because it starts to build a strong self-esteem, it starts to make people feel empowered, loved, and worthy of love. And your partner will stop feeling so overwhelmed by your needs. I will get to more about this just now because I know it can be very tricky when we are dating more of the avoidant personalities. But that is our part. Our part is to reconnect with ourselves, to stop running away, to stop numbing out and really find what am I feeling? What is my inner child screaming about? Am I, am I consistently criticizing myself in my head and telling myself that I am unworthy, that I am not good enough? In the coaching that I do, we work on healing these subconscious core wounds so that they don't fester as much. Healing the negative self-talk. Healing the relationship between you and your inner child. This is really powerful work. But what I'm just talking about in these videos are simple things that you can do immediately with what you have if you are dealing and healing this by yourself. Okay, because that's what most people are trying to do through watching the YouTube videos. So people who watch the YouTube videos need to really just tune in, tune in. Instead of numbing out, tune in. What am I feeling? What do I need? How do I fulfill this? And I know I sound like a broken record, but if you consider that insecure attachment style was created, all three of them, insecure attachment styles were created through inconsistent need fulfillment or neglect of their needs, right? The needs are at the root of it all. So this is the reason, okay, I've given you many topics here, but basically number one, what causes confusion? It's just our childhood. The programming we got in childhood caused a lot of confusion in our mind about is it okay to have needs? Yes, it's absolutely okay to have needs. We have to have needs. It is healthy to have needs. But 
if those needs are so big and so overwhelming that you feel if my partner doesn't fulfill this need, something bad is going to happen to me. Not to sound too dramatic, but a lot of people will tell me that it feels like their world is going to end, like they're going to die if their partner doesn't phone them back or doesn't tell them they love them or they don't see them uh, twice a week or something like that, right? And that is an indication that we are being too needy of our partner. We are trying to get them to give us something that... They can't. No matter how much they will try to give that to us, they will not measure up and it will make them feel extremely not enough. The whole in the soul needs to be soothed through connection with self, healing the abandonment core wound, healing the I am not enough, I am unworthy core wounds, I am unlovable. So, both the pain can go away, that self-criticism can go away, and we are fulfilling our own needs, which makes us feel more secure within ourselves. And then when our partner says, no, sorry, I have to work late, I cannot meet today, we don't feel like the whole world is going to fall apart because every single need that I have is dependent on my partner. That is too much. That is really, really too much. That every single need that you have for connection, for love, for conversation, for communication, for sex, for stimulation, for play, like that is, that is a lot for one person to handle. Thinking that a, a whole individual's happiness is reliant on me. Wow, that is a lot, right? Especially if that individual doesn't know how to fulfill their own needs because we're going to go to our partner and want stuff and want 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 and whatever they do it might never be enough or we might just be dissatisfied and constantly make them feel like they are just not doing it right which is a big tricky part that fearful avoidance sometimes do and the reason for that is because again, it's, they can't give you something that you need to give to yourself. And yes, at first, it's not going to feel good to bond with yourself, to connect, to, to fulfill your own needs. But you need to start building that relationship. Do it consistently. And there will be less pressure on your partner. Relationships are a lot more than just our conversation and communication. Most of relationship happens through energy, through our nervous system. We don't even have to be in the same room. And this might sound like super airy fairy to you, but I promise you it is like that. You might have experienced it, that if somebody is cutting you out of their life, is blocking you, you can feel that. You don't have to be in that same room as them. They can be at work, you can be somewhere else, you can feel that. And it's the same when we are very needy and anxious of somebody, they can feel that. And therefore, we have this very funny power dynamic and push-pull dynamic. Okay, so first of all, it's super in your control that you can go get the list from my website or the CNVC website, the Center of Nonviolent Communication amazing resources there. Go and have a look at it. Go and have a whole, uh, have a squiz at the nonviolent communication model, Marshall Rosenberg's work. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. And if you start to practice that, which you can do by yourself, then you will start to see shifts. Okay. So let's get to, oh, this is what I wanted to mention as well. What is the effect of not fulfilling your needs by yourself? Wow, it is so big and it is pervasive throughout your whole life, okay? So if we are dishonest about the needs that we have, say for example, I have all of these needs that I'm disconnected from. I am going to show up in the world and pretend like I don't have these needs. And this is what usually happens with anxious, preoccupied and fearful avoidance in the dating stage of a relationship. They will portray themselves as people who are independent, they don't need anything from anybody, 
they sometimes can play those games or you, it's not really a game for a lot of people. It's like kind of dating etiquette where don't message too quickly, wait a day. When they message you back, don't message back immediately. This is just a setup for creating an insecure attached relationship. Do not do that to yourself. Okay, It is toxic. At the same time, do not bombard your person with messages to start to notice where am I acting from? Bombarding somebody with their with your messages is coming from that hole in the soul, from thinking that you are the, the source of my need fulfillment and I need you to feel okay. Okay, start to notice the difference. If you are unable to pause, take a breath and calm yourself before you reply, this means you are being too needy. You're acting too much from that emotionality where you are using your partner like a substance. That's also not cool to use somebody like that, okay? Because we often talk about how it's not cool for the dismissive avoidance to withhold needs. But it's also not cool for the anxious type or the fearful avoidant to, to, to use their partner like a drug. <laughs> I feel like I'm calling all of us out. Don't, it's not only you, it's me as well. I'm also part of this. But you know, if we are at the dating stage or even when we are applying for a job, we pretend or we are out of touch with our needs. We cannot really get what we want. If you show up at a job interview and you're like, yes, I can work these crazy hours. I can work overtime. I do not need a weekend off. Yes, you can send me to some kind of removed location for three weeks and I'll be fine there. I'll do whatever you need me to do to just get this job. If you enter a job with that kind of attitude, what do you expect to get? That is what you're going to get. If you do not ask for your needs to be met, and I, I know I used to do this as well, not only in my romantic relationships, but in my work relationships. I used to put myself under so much stress because I used to give, 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 and then not receive something from somebody. And it was just very, very frustrating and ex extremely energy consuming where I ended up in burnout. And a lot of people with the anxious and fearful avoidant attachment styles do end up in burnout exactly for these reasons being out of touch with their needs and then being inauthentic and getting something that they don't want, like setting yourself up for a relationship that is not going to fulfill your needs. Because if you present yourself as somebody that doesn't have needs, then you're going to attract a person who's interested in a person that they don't need to fulfill their needs, right? All right. So I hope I got that point across. Number three. So, okay, so how do we figure out what are my needs that are okay for me to ask for my partner and what, are, what is too much? Okay, and this lies in between in the relationship as well. You have to figure out that dynamic. But like I said, if you feel like your world is going to end if your partner doesn't fulfill these needs, this is usually an indication that you are most probably not fulfilling your needs. If you cannot sit and figure out what are three ways that I can fulfill this need by myself if my partner is not available, then most probably you're using your partner to fulfill needs that you could be fulfilling for yourself, but you don't know how. So that's the exercise you can do. You can actually sit and figure out three ways to fulfill my own needs. And say, for example, you are fulfilling your own needs, right? You have a nice social circle. You know that you can chat to Betty. You can go out and have fun with Sue. You can go out and have this hobby or this activity. And your cups, you're maintaining four cups for yourself. And you're being consistent and you're showing up for yourself consistently. You're not prioritizing everybody. You're not, I call this prostituting yourself, but it's actually just a self-abandonment and self-betrayal. You're not self-abandoning. You're not self-betraying. You're really taking care of yourself, loving yourself, pouring into yourself. And your partner is consistently unavailable for things that are important to you. Maybe that is deep conversation, for touch, for sex, for 
play, for whatever it is that you might be needing from your partner. Okay, it's very important to identify, be specific. Don't just say this relationship is unfulfilling. If you're saying that, you're most probably out of touch with your emotions and needs. You're not specific. You don't know which needs are being unfulfilled. You don't know if you're supposed to fulfill those needs, if you can fulfill those needs. Most of the needs we can fulfill for ourselves. I'm not saying become dismissive avoidant and an island to yourself and never ask anything from anybody. When we have the anxious, preoccupied or fearful avoidant attachment style, it's extremely empowering and soothing to learn how to fulfill our own needs. Right, And then what we get from others is just a bonus. So when you're in that space and you're showing up for yourself like you would, would like your partner to show up and you're communicating your needs with your partner saying like, hey, you know what? I'd really love to connect with you. I miss you. Um, let's have dinner together. When are you available? And you're working with them. You're also working with their core wounds, right? You're being sensitive to their trauma. You're approaching them in a way that is open and loving and inviting. And they are still coming back as hostile, definitely. This should not be hostile at all. Like if somebody is gaslighting you, you can just call them out on it because like I said, they're not necessarily doing that consciously, but it's still not cool. You know, if somebody tells you, oh, you're so sensitive, you're so needy, you this, 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 this. You can have needs. And if your partner tells you you needy, you can own that and say like, yeah, I have needs. I really like when we connect. And I think this is a really nice need for me to have and that we can share. If you are unavailable to fulfill that need, that's okay. Just let me know. And that will give you information. A lot of fearful avoidance and anxious preoccupieds will want their partner to tell them, no, I cannot fulfill their needs. But if you're dating the dismissive types, they are most probably going to show that to you through their actions and not necessarily voice it because they have a tendency to people please. So often they will make plans, agree to things and then not follow through on that. If somebody is not following through on that, you gently say to them, hey, we had these plans and these plans and these plans and I see that this is not happening for us. What's going on? Dismissive avoidance will tell you, oh, I'm tired, my work is busy, I'm being stressed, blah, 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 blah. And then you have to decide. You decide from that. That is information. That is a reply. You have to decide from that. Is that enough for me? Okay. Is that enough for me? A lot of the time, the anxious types try to figure out, am I enough for my partner? And they don't spend enough time trying to ask the question of, is this connection filling me? And if you're fulfilling your own needs and you're asking from your partner the like your fundamentals, most important things to be fulfilled, you have to figure out what that is. For fearful avoidance, it's often deep conversations, doing activities together where you can share common emotions that you, activities that you really, really like, um, and physical touch. For anxious, preoccupied individuals, it's romantic gestures, it's words of affirmation, and it's gifts. Also, sometimes quality time, quality time is, is very big for both of these as well, but it just comes in different forms. A quality time for an anxious might be doing something romantic, like a romantic gesture, candle at dinner. Meanwhile, for the fearful avoidant, it might be something like an activity that they really like, that they want their partner to enjoy with them. Okay, so if your partner is unavailable for that, and you cannot negotiate and somehow meet in the middle. If they are gaslighting you, they are hostile towards you, or every time you, you, you speak about their needs, they say yes and then don't, don't follow through. Then this is a sign that your partner and you are not meeting in the middle, okay? Which can then be addressed and you can say like, hey, you know what? This is very important for me in a relationship and this is not happening here. Are you willing to work with me on this? Maybe your partner needs to work on their attachment style so that they can be more open to fulfilling your needs. And if they are not, if they in no way want to collaborate with you 
and support you, then it doesn't seem like you are compatible. Then you need to decide, am I willing to go through my life being unfulfilled in the relationship or do I call this quits, all right? And find a person that I'm going to be compatible with. Maybe in the next relationship, instead of hiding who you are and being inauthentic at the first stages of the relationship, you can show up with all your needs, with all your requirements, with all your deal breakers and boundaries. And that will set you up for a better relationship, set you up for a partner that is more compatible. Some of these things, of course, can be worked out if your partner is willing to collaborate. This is the most important thing. If your partner is not willing to collaborate, you cannot do anything. There is no conversation. There is no special phrase. You know, I see these ads on the internet like, say this to her or this one thing will make your partner come back to you. Do you want to manipulate somebody into loving you? Because even if you do say that one special phrase, what it's going to do is most probably trigger some kind of trauma in that person. And then you're going to trauma bond, get into a toxic connection. And is that what you really want? Do you want somebody to be addicted to you or trauma bonded to you? Or do you want somebody to be really invested in you because you're honest and authentic and they love you for who you are? And for the rest of your life, you can just relax and be yourself and be happy together, right? Because if you pretend that you are this person that you're not, they will not be happy when you change and you will not be happy to keep up that pretense for the rest of your life. It's going to be a very difficult and unfulfilling situation for both parties. So it is very, very, very important to have these conversations with our partners. And also our needs change as we move through life, as we have kids, as we age, as we change jobs. It's very important to keep having these conversations about our needs. Matt and I have these conversations about like, hey, what, are, what is important to you right now? What are the needs that are being fulfilled by the relationships? the relationship, <laughs> just one, just one, our relationship. What are some of the needs that are not being fulfilled by the relationship? How can we meet those? Okay, so we try to collaborate on that and that really, really helps. The only reason why we are together, and you know that we are a fearful avoidant, we started, us, we started as me being fearful avoidant, him being dismissive. The only reason why we are together is because we are both willing to work on it. I see so many people commenting on, on, this, uh, on these videos that their partner is not willing to collaborate with them, is not being willing to be influenced by them and change in any way. Whew, guys, that is intense, right? That is a very intense situation to be in. It's not a situation that I would choose for myself. Of course, we are all allowed to love whoever we love and we are all allowed to be in relationships that we want to be in. But just realize that relationships don't have to be so, so hard. And there are people who are dismissive avoidant who want to work on themselves, like fearful avoidance and anxious preoccupied people, right? There are people like that that want to work on themselves and on the relationship. And those are usually the relationships that are successful that I see. The relationships where, say, the DA is completely offline, either hostile or shuts down for months or end, that, that doesn't often last. Or if it lasts, it's because there is like one person that doesn't want to let go and that person is going through tremendous trauma and, and lots of strain. So it's very important that you look after yourself because the relationship has to work for both, all right, for you and for your partner, it needs to be a collaboration because that is, according to Stan Tatkin, a part of secure functioning. So I hope this gave you a very clear answer, right? If you feel like I'm going to die if my partner doesn't fulfill this need for me right now, then this is an indication that you are being needy. Something inside of you is being triggered. Does that mean you cannot in that moment still ask your partner to fulfill that need? Not at all. 
when I was going through high anxiety in my relationship with Matt, I would lean on him heavily, but I would be very honest to say like, hey, I'm really triggered into suspicion right now. I'm feeling extremely insecure. And I would take responsibility for that and voice that to him. And then we would collaborate on, on a solution, right? So our partner can still help us even when we are being needy. But then we still work on fulfilling our own needs, right? And feeling whole inside, healing that hole in the soul. Because our partner is never going to be enough, no matter how amazing they are, how secure they are, how loving they are. They will never be enough. They will never replace the connection that you can have with yourself, that your inner child or your soul is calling for. All right, so I hope this helped you. It's a nice long one and juicy one today. Lots of energy for you. And thank you so much for being here, for all your questions and comments, subscribing and for sharing. And I will see you in the next one. Big love.